please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Verse 1 says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back and sealed with seven seals. In the United States of America, when you buy a piece of property or a piece of real estate, the bank gives you a title deed, a piece of paper that says, whatever, blah, 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 address, Bremerton Lane belongs to Matt Norman. If you buy a house, whatever. They give you a title deed. It's been that way for thousands of years. In the Roman Empire, when you bought a piece of property, the bank gave you a title deed, said this piece of property belongs to you. And title deeds in the Roman Empire were scrolls, but they weren't any run-of-the-mill scroll. No, they were scrolls sealed with seven seals. The scroll in verse 1, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals, is a title deed to what? A piece of property. What piece of property? The planet Earth. A very, very large and enormous piece of property. Right here, the title deed in the hand of God to the planet Earth. Remember the story of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, what? There you go, Brooke. God what? Created. Very good job, Brooke. Yes, knows Genesis 1, 1. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the skies and the clouds that are raining and the trees and the orchids and the grass and the mountains, the valleys, the oceans, the rivers, the lakes, creation. God is a creator. By the way, he created you. And creation is beautiful and you are beautiful in the eyes of God. Don't buy into the lies of grocery store magazines that say you have to be seven foot tall and weigh nine pounds to be good looking gals. It's okay. God created you beautiful in the eyes of God. He is a creator. And God created the heavens and the earth. And he gave the earth, the title deed, if you would, to the earth, to a man by the name of what? Adam. Remember the story? Adam right there, the first man that God created, formed out of the dust of the ground, breathed life into his being. God gave the earth to Adam. But Adam, you know the story, blew it. He dropped the ball. He sinned. God said, man, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge and good of evil. Remember, there were a lot of trees in the garden, beautiful trees. There was a tree of life there. But Adam made the mistake that you make that I make, that we make. There was the tree of life, but he didn't eat of that tree. He ate of the one tree, the forbidden fruit, and he sinned. We make that mistake. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life abundant. There is a tree of life. Abide in the vine, you'll bear much fruit. But we make that mistake and we taste of the forbidden fruit. Adam sinned. He blew it. He dropped the ball. And the title deed, if you would, to the earth was transferred from Adam to Satan, the angel that fell from heaven. You say, really? That's in the Bible? Yes. That's why God in the scripture calls Satan the God, small g, of this world. That's why Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. That's why Satan said to Jesus, remember the story, Jesus in the wilderness tempted Satan tempted Jesus and said, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world, all their glory, because they were Satan's to give. I'll give them to you, Jesus, if you, Jesus, bow down and worship me. But Jesus said, no, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. But Satan has this world. People say, why is there war and famine and disease, AIDS in Africa? Why is there murder and rape? Why is there tragedy after tragedy? Why is that God? No, that is not God. That is the God of this world, the prince of this world, Satan. He has the title deed to the planet Earth. That's the bad news. But the good news is that by Roman law and Jewish law, when a man forfeited on a loan, defaulted on a loan, didn't make the payments, the bank would repossess the property, take it back. But they would write on the outside of the scroll, like the scroll right here, written inside and on the back. They would write on the back, on the outside, seven conditions that had to be met. And if a man from the family that defaulted on the loan, a kinsman redeemer, they were called, if a man could meet the seven conditions, 
by the seven seals, that man could buy back the piece of property. That man could redeem the piece of property. The bad news is the earth, the title deed is transferred, but the good news is that title deed, the earth can be bought back. It can be redeemed by the kinsman redeemer, by the redeemer and savior, Jesus Christ. Verse two says, then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. By the way, parenthetically, when Christmas time rolls around, how many of you guys like Christmas? I love Christmas. Love it. So does, uh, where are you? So does this guy. I have to tell you this story. Where are you? Is she here tonight? Oh, I don't know if she's here. She's not here right now. Oh, this gal, I'll leave her name unknown so we don't embarrass her. She's in the grocery store. What is she? What's, what's Stephanie? Well, that was her name. <laughs> what is she, 21, 22? She's in the grocery store. This, this 15-year-old kid walks up to her and says, hey, ma'am. And that was her first warning light right there. Ma'am, can I take a picture of you? Because I want to tell Santa Claus just what I want for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best pickup line I've ever heard. Man, these young kids, they just got all the moves. Man, <sighs> can I take a picture of you for Santa Claus? Speaking of Christmas, Christmas time. Angels, you see angels everywhere at Christmas. Pictures on postcards, your mom's sweater, in storefront windows. There are angels and they all look the same. They're white women with blonde hair and blue eyes and white dresses with little silver wings. Oh, and they're beautiful, but I don't know where they came from because they are nowhere in the Bible. The angels in the Bible are, sorry to say, gals, they're all men, at least all the ones we read about, are all men, and they are strong men, like with flaming swords and fighting Satan and demons and all that stuff that wet, white dresses aren't very good for, you know? And here's a strong angel. D don't picture a, a gal with blonde hair and blue eyes in a dress waving her wings. You know, no, this is, this is like Brooke Moser up there. I mean, we're talking bulging biceps. I mean, we're talking a Ben Newell man of, of might and valor. This is, <laughs> this is an angel, the strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who, verse 2, here's, his, here's the angel's question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? What a question. The title deed to the earth, the scroll sealed with seven seals. Who is worthy? Who can meet the conditions? Who can buy back that scroll? Who can redeem the earth from Satan? Who? Who is worthy? And verse three, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. No one was worthy. Men are willing Hitler was willing. Napoleon was willing. Gobias Khan, or whatever his name is, was willing to rule the world. However you say that, forgive me, you history, you smart people, not me. We're willing to rule the world, but they were not worthy. Who was worthy? No one in heaven or on earth. So, verse 4, I wept much. Gals, can you relate right there? So, <laughs> I wept what? Like that's an insult. You're denying it. We don't cry. Yeah, right. Give me a break. I'm not even going to feel bad for that one. Don't even try to make me feel bad for that one. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. John, and he was a guy. Guys do it too once in a while. I do it every couple of years. John wept. The word wept in the Greek means burst into tears. John wept. He burst into tears. There's no one in heaven or on earth worthy to open the scroll, the title deed, to redeem the earth. He wept. But, verse 5, one of the elders said to me, do not weep. The elders' words of exhortation to John and my words of encouragement to you, do not weep. I'm talking to guys and to gals. Do not weep. John wept, think with me, because he did not understand. He understood that there was no one in heaven or in the earth, no man worthy to open the scroll, to redeem the earth. But he did not understand that there was one, the Son of Man, who was worthy 
to redeem the earth, to open the scroll. He didn't understand. He mourned and he wept and he burst into tears because he did not understand. Mourning and misunderstanding are one and the same. We mourn and we weep and cry and burst into tears because we do not understand. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, All things work together for good to those who love God. Do you love God? Doesn't say to those who are sinless. No. Jake Fisher's here. Hey, Jake, my good Medford friend. Good to see you. Round of applause for Jake right there. But we mourn because we don't understand that all things work together for good. We don't understand life. We don't know which way is up, which way is down. We do not understand. That's why we weep. That's why we cry. We don't understand. God is working all things together for good. All things? Yes, all things. But what about the bad things, John Mark? What about the man that ravished me, raped me? What about the woman who betrayed me or belittled me? What about that? That's God working together for good? That's not God. We talked about that a minute or two ago. That is Satan. But God works all things together for good. It is God, Philippians says, who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is working in you all things. He's working his will, his good pleasure. He's working good in your life. Do not weep, my friends. Do not weep. My brothers, my sisters, I'm not saying it's a sin to cry once in a while. I'm saying do not weep. Don't be down and out. Why so downcast, O oh, my soul? Put your hope in God. Do not cry because Mr. Wright isn't in your life right here and right now. Because of this that happened to you or that that happened to you. You don't understand that God is working all things together for good. Do not weep. The words encouragement to John and to men like you and people like you and me. Do not weep. Behold, verse 5, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Two names for Jesus, the one worthy to open the scroll. First, the lion of the tribe of Judah from Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. There Israel, father of 12 sons, calls his son Judah, the father of the tribe of Judah, and says, Judah, you are a lion. I'd like to hear that. My dad, dad never said that to me. I didn't hear anything like that, especially not after my basketball games. It was more like, sorry, son. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> man, I'm a disgrace. I am just a disgrace to anything athletic in, in, my, in my family. I'm sorry, but we're all a disgrace, which makes me feel better, I, you know. So sorry, Dad, I let you down on that one. You know, I played basketball. I love basketball growing up. I used to watch that movie, uh, Pistol Pete. You guys ever watched that movie? Yeah, all the guys are like, yeah, I had, I had the movie, you know, and Pistol Pete's this guy, and he put the blindfold on, and I'd go around the living room and try to dribble around the couch and run into walls and break stuff and all that. And man... All, all my childhood, I wanted to be a basketball player. My dad played basketball. You know, what I didn't realize is that it's not an athletic bone in my body. My feet have been size 12 since I was like three. And, man, I couldn't even walk across the parking lot. I remember fifth grade. It had been about three years since I got the ball in a game. No joke. Since I was in a basketball game and somebody passed me the ball. It had been about three years. I'm not exaggerating. This is the truth. And there I was at last, after three years of waiting, running back and forth, the ball was thrown to John Comer right there in the green jersey. And I grabbed it and I ran with all my heart the wrong direction. And I ran all the way to the other basket. And by God's grace, one of my own teammates stole the ball from me and ran back to the other side. Man, not an athletic bone in, man. The things that scar your childhood. God's working all things together for good. But I never heard you're a lion. But that was Israel's words to Judah. You are a lion, Judah, father of the tribe of Judah. Because the lion is the king of the jungle. Rumble, rumble. He is the king. And the kings of Israel, the lions, came from the tribe of Judah. 
Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the king of kings and Lord of lords. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My question is, where are you going to be when the world is on its knees? Is Jesus king of your life? Is he enthroned on the throne of your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit? Who's making the decisions in your life? Who's deciding where you go to college? Who's deciding when you work? Who's deciding who you date? Who's on the throne of your life? The king of kings, the Lord of lords. Ah, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Second title, the root of David. From Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, which says, There shall come forth a rod or a root from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his root. Speaking of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. There shall come forth a root, a tree trunk, if you would. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I am the vine or the tree trunk. You are the what? Branches. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. My question is, are you abiding in the vine, in Jesus? Are you waking up in the morning with prayer on your lips and praise and God's word in your ears and your eyes? Are you abiding day by day? Are you bearing fruit? Galatians says the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and goodness. Man, who doesn't want that in their lives? Do you have that in your life? Is there love in your life? Uh, no. Is there peace or anxiety, stress, biting the fingernails? Is there joy or depression, down and out? Man, if, if there is no love in your life, no joy, no peace, abide in the vine. Abide in Jesus. Man, spend your days with Jesus, your nights, your evenings, your afternoons, your mornings with Jesus, driving in the car, singing songs of praise, sitting on the couch, reading the Bible, falling asleep at night, lifting up prayers to heaven, abiding in the vine, like you would hang out with your best friend, hang out with the Lord Jesus, abide in the vine, you will bear much fruit. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, and the root of David. The branch, the vine, abide in Jesus. And verse 6, I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, we talked about them a week ago, in the midst of the elders, talked about them two weeks ago, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. John looks, and there is no lion, there is no branch, no, there's a lamb, as though it had been slain. Because Jesus is, the scripture says, the Lamb of God. Isaiah chapter 53 says, As a root out of dry ground, Jesus has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When we see Jesus in heaven, when we look, and there is Jesus revealed in the midst of the throne, when we see Jesus, he will not be beautiful. What? Yes, that's what Isaiah says. There's no form, there's no comeliness. He is not beautiful. No, he is a lamb as though it has been slain. Satan will be beautiful. He is an angel of light. When you get to heaven, you will see an angel of light that is going to hell. And you will see the lamb, Jesus, as though it had been slain. He is despised, Isaiah says, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from man. We couldn't look. It was gross and grotesque. We hid our faces. Surely he has borne our grief, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, a lamb, the Lamb of God, 
led to the slaughter, the sacrifice for your sin and my sin was on Jesus Christ. His blood was shed when it should have been your blood and my blood. He was on the cross when it should have been you, should have been me. There was Jesus, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice as though he had been slain. A lamb is meek and gentle. Jesus is meek. Come to me, all you who are weary and weak, and I will give you rest, Jesus said, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Jesus is gentle. The scripture says a bruised reed he shall not break. He's gentle with you, Grant. Gentle with me. Gentle with you, Chris. He's gentle. He is meek and he is gentle. He's like a lion. He's mighty. He's like a root or a branch. He's mature. And he's like a lamb. He is meek and gentle. Jesus, a lamb as though it had been slain. Having verse six says, seven horns, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Seven horns. Horns in the Bible symbolize power. They were symbols of power in Israel and Rome. Here, the lamb has seven horns. Jesus is omnipotent all-powerful. He has the power. He is able, the scripture says, to save. Whatever you are going through, wherever you are at, Jesus is able to save you. When you are weak, he is strong. He can save you from sin. He can save you from self. He can save you from depression, from despair, from discouragement. He is able to save. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, seven horns and seven eyes symbolizing sight. Jesus is omniscient. He sees you. The scripture says his eyes run to and fro in the earth. He sees into your mind, into your heart, into your life. He sees you. And seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Jesus is omnipresent. Jesus, his spirit in all the earth, everywhere at one time, no matter where you are at, Jesus is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Where can I go, the scripture says, from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of hell, you are there. Jesus, he sees you, he saves you, he surrounds you, he's omnipresent. Then verse seven, he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Jesus comes with his nail-scarred hand. He takes a lamb as though it had been slain, a lion, the root of David. He takes that scroll out of the hand of God, that title deed to the earth. He holds it up in his hand, the redeemer. He redeems the earth. Jesus, like a lion, mighty. Jesus, like the root of David, like a tree trunk, mature. Jesus, like a lamb. He is meek and gentle omniscient, omnipresent. Jesus, right there, scroll in hand. Now, verse eight. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. The 24 elders, man, this is a great chapter in the Bible fall down on their knees. The living creatures, we're going to read in a minute, all the angels, all of creation, fall down on their knees with a harp in one hand, symbolizing praise, and with golden bowls full of incense, symbolizing prayer. Prayer is like incense. The Bible says prayer is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. Like when you go home from mom's cooking, you walk in the front door and you smell that lasagna or whatever if your mom's a good cook, and it puts a smile on your face. Prayer is like that. It's a sweet-smelling aroma. It puts a smile on the face of God. And there are men with harps, praise, and there are men with incense, with prayer in heaven. Don't think of little Cupid angels with fight, you know, fat white bellies and little you know, harps on clouds, strumming harps in the clouds with glazed over eyes. That is not heaven. My friend Mike Gergen, who's a great guy, he, uh, we played in a band together a couple of years ago. He played bass. And he went a year or two ago to a U2 concert down in San Francisco, California. Drove down there. He's a diehard fan. And he spent about 450 bucks for front row seats. And he was right there, front row, 
San Francisco, California, 30,000 people, U2 concert. And there he is, and Bono's right in front of him singing. There's The Edge playing the guitar, Larry Mullins drumming away right there. And he said there's this kid right next to him, high school. I mean, just right next to him. You know, they met each other or whatever. And the kid's just there, a diehard fan. And there they are, front row. And right in the middle of the concert, U2 ends one song. And, and right in between songs, this, this guy, the security guys walk to the right and to the left. And this, this high school guy right next to Mike just looks to the right, looks to the left, jumps onto the stage. I mean, right there. And Mike's just like, oh man, this guy's going to get pounded. He's going to get pummeled, you know. And right there, the guy goes up. But he doesn't hug Bono or whatever everybody else does. No, he goes right for the guitars. And he grabs one of Bono's guitars, throws it on, and he's holding this guitar. And the whole crowd is just silent. I mean, just watching this high school kid up there in front of thousands of people at a U2 concert. And Bono and the guys are kind of looking at him. And Mike was just waiting. Any second, the security guys are going to see. And I just ripped the guy right off the stage. But no, Bono grabs the mic and says, do you know any of our songs? And the kid goes, yeah, play one. And the kid starts to play the intro to this song. And Bono fully goes, true story, one, two, three, four. Counts off, the whole band plays with this guy. He starts to sing. This is a high school kid. And Mike says, his edge is playing the guitar. And this kid's just up there strumming in front of 30,000 people. Yeah, 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 just going right there. Bono's just singing, looking the eyes back to the edge. You know, just going, yeah, just going right there. Man, can you imagine being that guy? You're up there playing guitar in front of 30,000 people rocking out with you two there. Can you imagine? You are going to be that guy in heaven. I am going to be that. I am getting a harp, man, in heaven. <laughs> I am playing with the angels, with the elders, man. I am playing. Man, we are going to have harps in heaven. Don't think of, you know, fat angels on clouds with harps. No, think of a U2 concert, but a thousand times greater and grander. Think of the light show in heaven. We read about the throne, a rainbow around the throne. Man, God is the light of heaven. Think of the sound in heaven, 10,000 times 10,000 of angels singing to God. And think of the show. Somebody a lot cooler than Bono or Chris Martin. Jesus, right there in the midst of the throne. Man, a concert can't hold a candle to worship in heaven. They sang a new song, verse 9, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings, priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then, verse 11, I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, not mumbling. Oh, praise him. No, with a loud voice rocking out. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen, and the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Man, we are going to be there harp in hand, on stage, the angels and the elders with Jesus. And tonight, I'm not going to preach a three-point sermon on worship in heaven. Because James says, be doers of the word. Not just hearers. You hear a Bible study, great. No, do the Bible study. Do the word. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. In heaven, man, that's great. There's singing with loud voices. There's praise. There's worship. There's people falling down on their knees. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Tonight we are going to worship. We're going to take 20, 30, 40 minutes, whatever. And we are going to worship tonight. Worship in the Bible is defined two ways. Either to turn and kiss... That's worship, turning to the Lord in intimacy. 
like you would to the love of your life and kissing the Lord, loving the Lord. And to give worth, giving worth to God, saying you are worthy. No one in heaven or earth could redeem the earth, could redeem. But you took our sin upon you. You were on the cross when we should have been there. You were beaten and bruised and broken when we should have been. Your blood was shed when our blood should have been shed. And giving worth to the Lord. Tonight, worship the Lord. Fall down on your knees, lift your hands, sing with a loud voice with your brothers and with your sisters. This is band practice for heaven where we are going to worship. Don't think of clouds and harps and angels. No, worship. We are going to worship. Amen. Jesus, I pray that tonight.